about half the United Kingdoms covered with country like this, steep and infertile and usually cold. It's a hard place for people to make a living and it's not much easier for wildlife. Take the birds that live here. To survive, most of them have to leave before the long winter begins. Perhaps we aren't so sensible. Every year someone dies of exposure in country like this. Sometimes even here, in the middle of England, just a few miles from the central heating and the shopping precincts of Manchester or Sheffield. As you go further north and west through the British Isles, you find this sort of country lower down off the hills. By the time you reach the north of Scotland or the west of Ireland, it's like this right down to sea level. It may not be quite as cold in winter, but it's wet and windswept, and life is just as difficult for people and for birds too. Most of us think of this kind of country as wild and unspoiled, as wilderness even. Far from it, over the centuries, man and his cattle and sheep have altered it out of all recognition. Now it's changing again, and the decisions about its future are being made not by the people who live here, but by civil servants and politicians who mostly live remote in London and Brussels. Opinions differ about whether what's happening will prove to be good or bad for the people of the hills, but there's little doubt that the changes will be bad for the bird life. To my mind, the upland bird is the red grouse. Grouse are splendidly adapted for life on the hills. In fact, they're one of the few birds that can live here year round. That's partly because they feed on the heather itself, and partly because they have a super storm-proof plumage that covers them right down to their toes. Last but not least, that rich brown mottling is good camouflage against the keen eyes of their natural predators like eagles and peregrine falcons. What birdwatcher doesn't thrill to the sight of a peregrine hunting over the hills or circling over some distant crag? And these powerful falcons are rare birds, just a few hundred pairs in the whole of the British Isles. Up here their numbers are limited by the scarcity of prey, not just because it's hiding in the heather either. The thing is that as the uplands aren't very fertile and the summer's short, the land simply can't support large numbers of birds and animals. This food constraint affects all the birds. Even the little meadow pipit, which is one of the commonest upland species, needs several acres of moorland to feed its tiny chicks, tucked out of sight in a nest well down in the heather. But neither adults nor young are safe if there are merlins on the hill, because they feed mainly on small birds, like pipits and skylarks. And these young merlins themselves face an uncertain future. Merlin numbers have crashed in recent years, and in part at least, that's because of the loss of the large areas of heather moorland that make the best breeding grounds. Ring ousel too sometimes nest in the heather, but usually they look for a site among the rocks, perhaps where a few trees have escaped the hungry jaws of the sheep. And because like their lowland cousin, the blackbird. 
They feed on worms and such. They often commute way downhill to forage on the nearest farmland. This enclosed land below the moor has a distinct bird community, mostly made up of species like lapwing, which are declining or even extinct in the lowlands as a result of agricultural change. On this in-by land, as it's called, the farmer winters his cattle or some of his sheep, feeding them on hay or silage grown there in the summer. Here, curlews sing their bubbling courtship song and proudly tend their newborn young. Wheat ears like the turf close cropped and rich in different kinds of plants to produce the insects that they need. And they solve the lack of nesting cover by simply diving into a pile of stones or a dry stone wall or even down a rabbit hole. The hill streams, too, have their own characteristic birds. Common sandpiper are only to be found breeding in the uplands. Watching this elegant and restless little bird picking its way along an idyllic water's edge, it's all too easy to forget the reality. The fact that the future destinies of all these birds, of sandpiper and grouse, curlew, merlin and the rest, depend on us. We have made the uplands what they are. Once long ago, all this sort of country was covered by trees, except for the tops of the highest hills. Gradually, men and women cleared the land, they cut out little fields, and they built their homes in the sheltered valleys. Cattle were the mainstay of their economy, and the way they used the countryside was, as far as we know, uh, a good one from the point of view of wildlife. But times changed. By the 19th century, people were streaming off the hills for life in the towns. Some were dispossessed to make way for the coming of the sheep. Today, sheep are the mainstay of hill farming from Dartmoor to Shetland. The sheep brought benefits for the carrion birds, not least the ravens that grow fat on the thousands of animals that die in the hills each winter. But for most moorland birds, sheep farming is bad news. For every animal he keeps, the hill farmer gets a subsidy payment. Naturally, when money's tight, there's a great temptation to put more sheep on the land, perhaps more than it can carry. The sheep destroy the heather and they eat out all the nutritious grasses. And the end is a piece of hill that's not much use to man or beast or to birds either. Nowadays, the trend's in a different direction. It's reseeded and fertilised and it'll carry plenty of sheep all year round. Good for man and beast, in fact, but still no good for birds. Now government is cutting some of the subsidies, which may ease the pressures on birds, but leaves hill farmers facing an uncertain future. Stand right. I spoke to John Hooson, who farms on the edge of the Snowdonia National Park in North Wales, and I asked him how he saw things developing. I expect to see what well, there are already and quite heavy cuts in the agricultural grant system uh, which are going to hit us and have hit us a little bit hard actually. But I think that we'll weather most of these and I think that we will continue on more or less the lines that we have been but I think you'll see a lot less improvement in inverted commas of upland pastures. I don't expect to see the plough going up the the hill or into the, the marsh quite as much as it was because the subsidies are no longer there. Now this is going to provide problems perhaps for the farmers in that 
that sort of improvement of land did in fact help him to keep up with the rest of the community. That sort of six or seven percent increase which everybody expects as of right virtually. And that was provided largely with the aid of grant aid in order to help us make a better place of where we live. I think that that might slow down, but we'll cope. But uh, wouldn't you cope better if uh, hill farmers were compensated to keep habitats like marshes and moorland, uh, paid to farm to protect the countryside, in other words? Well, if it's on a large area, uh, compensation for certain specific areas. I want to see money putting in, being put into specific areas, albeit smallish ones. But to, to put a blanket thing right across the whole of the uplands and say we're giving every farmer such and such uh, an environmental grant, I think is unnecessary. I've always thought this, it's not a popular view within the farming uh, fraternity perhaps, but if you can prove that we are doing something which is antisocial, and if it's patently obviously so uneconomic as well, then change the policy. The government will have to change policies. Well, if things turn out as you're saying, does that then mean that there are going to be less people living in the hills in the future? Um, it could be, but I don't believe so, and I would hope very much that what would happen would be get more, go back to the sort of family farming size, uh, a type of farm, and instead of having one large farm of 2,000 acres, I would much prefer to see 10, 200, 200 acre farms. I believe that stepping back a little bit, not trying to get huge buildings and get huge agri-enterprises up in the hills, I think that there's a place for the family farm, 20 or 30 such farms, as I said, producing 20 or, 20 or 30 families, children, village schools, post offices and all the rest of it. I think we have to step back a little bit, and I prefer that to be done than to have large money uh, pushed in to produce park keepers who are not real farmers. In the last 40 years or so, another land use has joined hill farming as a major influence on the uplands. Huge areas of land have been planted with quick-growing conifers, and though these forests are very different from the native woodlands that once grew here, they do attract many kinds of birds. Short-eared owls and hen harriers, for instance, find these young plantations a splendid place to hunt for voles and to nest in the deep cover. Blackcock, too, seemed to benefit from the spread of the new plantations. Visiting a blackcock lek at dawn is an experience not to be missed. Well, with such splendid birds benefiting from the new plantations, it's not surprising that many bird watchers welcomed forestry. Sadly, that honeymoon is over for several reasons. For instance, recently we've learnt that new afforestation can affect the upland rivers in an unexpected way. Afforestation on some soils has the effect of acidifying the water that runs off the planted land. And that acidity kills the thriving insect populations that provide food for fish like the trout and for that special bird of the tumbling streams, the dipper. But the main worry is that afforestation is rapidly removing the habitat of moorland birds, like red grouse and curlew, which are already under pressure from hill farming intensification, as well as the habitat of great rarities, like green shank and dunlin. 
So on the one hand, new forestry creates habitat for one group of birds, which are mostly getting commoner. On the other hand, it destroys the habitat of another group of birds, which are rapidly getting rarer. On balance, conservationists today feel that forestry is more of a threat than an asset. And they're not alone in that opinion. Dr James Hunter works for the Crofters' Union, and he looks at forestry from the point of view of local communities in the Scottish Highlands. What we would like to see is farmers, crofters, being given the opportunity to get into forestry on their own account as independent operators, so that a man could have on his own ground a piece of forestry which he would work, particularly at slack times in the farming year, in the winter and so on. Now this happens in other parts of Europe and we see no reason why it couldn't happen here. The advantage of that, of course, would be that it would add to the income of these families that we would keep these people on the ground because, OK, they can't, at the moment, get an adequate livelihood from agriculture alone, but they could, with a little bit of help from forestry and other things, build up a, a worthwhile income. That's the real value of forestry from the point of view of keeping people on the ground, keeping communities going. What we have at the moment is a situation where there's relatively little employment, no great benefit to the locality at all, and the whole thing's been run in the interests of people far away. One reason for the advance of afforestation and pasture improvement across the hills is the mix of tax concessions or subsidies that they enjoy. But another important cause is the retreat of two uses that once held sway over vast areas, deer stalking and grouse shooting. A profitable shoot needs thriving grouse populations, and that means management of the habitat. David Parkinson is the keeper of 4,000 acres of moor in the Pennines. David, as well as the grouse, what other birds are there on the moor? Mm. The curlews arrive here in March and uh, nest here in great numbers, and golden plover also. Great breeding area too for snipe. All these do very, very well up here. Plus the meadow pivot, common bird, and the skylarks, and the wheat ear is always a joy to see here. I'm sure you know keepers have a bad reputation for killing birds of prey. Do you think that's justified? No, not fully. I can't say it's fully justified. I can see, understand the keeper getting irritated when he finds maybe young pheasants or young grouse, partridge, whatever, killed. But I think if he went into it a little bit deeper, the total effect by these birds would be minimal. David, in some other parts of Britain? Well, if the moor isn't managed by a keeper, you would have uh, heather growing wild, reaching a height of something like three feet, and then falling over to become straggly. Nothing could move in it. There would be less and less good, suitable habitat. Less in insect life in decaying heather, as opposed to nutritious growing heather for young birds to feed on. And there would be a gradual decline in the population on the moor. Burning may look catastrophic, but at the right time and under careful control, it creates a mosaic of old and new heather across the hill, the old giving cover and nest sites, the new providing ample fresh growth for feeding. <laughs> 
A lot of people would like to see an end to grouse shooting. But there is the paradox that killing the birds keeps them alive. Because when grouse management ends, the land goes to sheep or to Sitka spruce trees. And that means the destruction of the heather, the extermination of the grouse themselves, and the disappearance of most of the other wildlife of the moor. It isn't easy to sum up what's happening in the uplands. The issues are complex and they're not the same all over. But broadly the picture seems to be this. Modern sheep farming is bad for bird life. Recent cuts in subsidies may mean less pressure on habitats, but no responsible conservationist wants to see hill farmers going broke and rural communities in further decline. In any case, that would mean more land going to blanket forestry, which on balance isn't good for conservation either, and creates very few new jobs. Grouse management is good for most moorland birds, but it's in decline anyway. Finally, we should remember that tourists contribute more to the economy of places like Exmoor, or the Peak District, or Speyside, than either hill farming or forestry. So, is there any solution that maintains jobs, protects communities, and safeguards the environment? One person who thinks so is Ozzie Johnson. His farm, Otter Cops, is on an estate in Northumberland, and he believes that integration is the way forward. Well, Otter Cops is two and a half thousand acres, and uh, we have a fell which is principally heatherland, and uh, only about two to three hundred acres of uh, improved land and fenced land from which we produce hay and silage for the winters. And uh, we keep a stock on here of 1,400 Swaledale ewes and 62 cows, suckler cows. Quite candidly, we, we should be able to make a living from sheep on these farms. and run the sheep and the grouse, etc., together, so that they can be complementary to each other. And the cattle, I think they're an extra which we can accommodate on the better land in certain smaller numbers. Uh, our landlord has been good enough to plant some shelter belts. They are, what, 10 years of age now, and they are affording some shelter even now. A lot of them are about four to eight acres. And uh, on hindsight, I think we might have made them a little bit bigger and thereby grow a bit of timber and uh, shelter for the sheep. I do know that there's a lot of timber required in this country and the tendency is for blanket afforestation. And this to me is the most devastating thing on earth to the hills. And uh, I do honestly believe that in the future we should have this word integration not a myth as it has been in the past, but uh, becoming a reality. So that we can grow trees, we can grow heather for the grouse and shelter for the sheep, and the whole thing should be able to run quite smoothly together. It's examples like that where integration does seem to work, that make conservationists believe that a solution can be found. But integration won't happen by magic. It needs new government policies and redirection of the millions of pounds that support upland farming and forestry. One final point to remember, whether as tourists or taxpayers, you and I foot the bill for what happens here. If the crisis in the uplands isn't solved, we are at least partly to blame.